Welcome to In The Zone, our series of interviews podcast from the Middle East Treaty Organization, MATO, digging underneath the debates around banning weapons of mass destruction from the region. I'm your co-host, Anne Heater. And I'm Paul. Uh, remember, eradication of WMD is possible. It's actually a matter of political will. And today we're talking with Renata Duan of Chatham House, recently director of the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, where she kickstarted a major program with a focus on the Middle East to support the establishment of the WMD Free Zone. And I think that's where we'll start, Renata. Um, what's the thinking behind the program? Um, who is involved? And what did you hope UNIDIR will achieve, would achieve with the project? Well, hi, Paul and Anahita, and uh, thanks for having me here today. And I should, of course, say that our thinking about this project is now being led by my colleagues uh, yes. still in unity or now that I've left, but happy to share a little bit of some of the thoughts and the origins uh, of that work. I think we were initiated or we were encouraged to think about the Middle East WM free, WMD free zone, partly because it seemed such a stuck topic in international arms control uh, debates and discussions. It was intimately linked, as you know, to the non Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and to developments in that uh, space. And it's been come almost as a barnacle on a broader discussion about nuclear non-proliferation and nuclear disarmament. And so we wanted to say, why is it the case that the zone has become viewed first as an addendum to another process and more important for the NPT than it is for the security, the well being, the development, and the peace in the Middle East. But second, why has it become such a topic of frozenness? I can't think of a better word, but a sense of a, of a space that is not really amenable and opening to engagement. And we thought that perhaps one of the ways that we could uh, think about that question or those questions might be to go backwards and trace the evolution of the zone and trace the discussions, trace the debates, trace the triggers around certain initiatives, positive or negative, in the 40 years of the zone's uh, debate and discussion and the extent to which this proposal has been uh, in the international space. A second reason we thought of doing this was because we were conscious that there's a generation of civil servants, experts, policymakers that worked on the zone, that were present at the creation, so to speak, in the 1970s when the issue was first proposed. Egypt and Iran both claimed some ownership in that space. And of course, in the period of time in the 1990s, when it was um, very much linked to the Middle East peace process, as well as to the uh, discussions around the NPT's extension. And those people are retiring now, those people are moving on. So we felt it was really important to try to capture, try to register, try to understand those stories and to try to understand their engagement. The third thing that really motivated us, and if to some extent, I think this was the more novel aspect is that a lot of the discussions and the debates and the efforts around the zone have centered around the idea of bringing everyone around the table, of getting people together from all sides of the countries uh, involved and particularly the key countries involved, and then to sort of hammer out a treaty, and to negotiate a text. And it seemed to us that we may not be in that opportunity, in that ripe moment for that uh, sort of discussion to take place. Could a more fruitful way to be, rather than discussions in external spaces, whether they're Geneva, whether it's Lyon, whether it's other uh, external rooms and conference centers, to go to the country as themselves and to go to the region itself? and to try to animate a discussion within countries, not between countries initially, but within countries, to allow for policymakers within their own national contexts to perhaps reflect a little bit more on what pathways that were chosen, pathways that could have been taken, themes and issues that were perhaps underexplored. 
And also to get a broader sense of voices, because when you're in the international policy space, it's only ever going to be a certain set of voices from any certain set of countries. So that was really an attempt to say, could we start the discussion within each country? Could that yield perhaps more nuanced perspectives, more multiple perspectives, perhaps different voices, perhaps younger voices? And then can that at least provide, I wouldn't say building blocks, but the basis for some discussion and analysis that we wouldn't try to get everyone to agree to that we would produce, but could then be a basis possibly for some regional uh, discussion at a subsequent next phase, which is where I hope the project will go. It's supported by the European Union, that I should say. And it's been interesting to see how countries have approached the project, but with a degree of caution, but with, to some extent, a willingness to at least contemplate that that might be an exercise worth undertaking. Thank you. There is a, there is a sense I pick up, uh, and it's accords with my experience, uh, that uh, there are certain um, approaches, positions, attitudes within the debate up to now that have been quite uh, inflexible. Um, and that's not to point to any particular side in this. I think this is a shared problem <laughs> across many, many actors. And um, some of that inflexibility arises from uh, people talking past each other and, and sticking to their own, their own uh, lens, if you like. And the lenses that I've witnessed have been um, justice, sense of injustice. Another lens is security uh, and a sense of identity that uh, is wrapped up with security. There are plethora of victim stories uh, that go back hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, uh, victim, persecutor, rescuers, you know, the drama triangles involved. Um, is there something here, Renata, from your experience uh, over this? And uh, as somebody looking from outside uh, to some extent, is there is there something here that triggers you into thinking about whether whether there's some mirroring that needs to be done, that, that, that people need to be encouraged to see the way in which their identity and their framing can sometimes get in the way of 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 uh, conversations across boundaries across borders yeah i think that's very much the case um paul i think there is a value in encouraging people to reflect on how their position could be viewed by another in particular an adversary and also to give some thought to the pathways to an adversary's perspective. So you could see that as part of a conflict mediation or conflict resolution approach and, and, and to, to think about that. But I don't think that that's the only uh, element one wants to achieve. I think it's a necessary but not sufficient mm -hmm. step to progress. And I think sometimes it's a step that can be difficult to get to if you don't first start from the idea of encouraging people to reflect on where they've arrived at and what those positions are. Because in, as you know, in the zone history and in the zone story, there's also some notions of inevitability or of the only path is that was chosen as the path that our policy position is. And, and I think a big part of our exercise and our project is to explore how that journey took place, that there were pathways to choose and pathways were chosen. Maybe at the time driven by a particular international moment, the environment in the 1990s, the environment in the 2000s, the environment in the last decade, each shaped some of those issues, some of those thinking, but understanding those pathways and understanding how they we came to be on one or two particular ones is, I think, a, a very helpful step to start to then think about how they're perceived 
by the other and how that can be merged. So I think it's definitely uh, uh, one step. On your point about the fact that there are many, many multiple um, dynamics at work here, historical, contemporary security, identity, justice, um, development perspectives too, because let's not forget the whole debates in the, in the region on peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Um, I think it's also, I'm struck by the parallels that we're having around the debates of Iran and the JCPOA right now, and the debates around the zone, because we're looking at an arms control proposal or arrangement, and then we're trying to look at whether that framework solves a whole set of problems that are not limited to arms control. And we're having a debate or, of whether it's regional security first that then leads to arms control or whether it's an arms control first that then leads to regional security. And, and in a way, the JCPOA debate and the debate about that is exactly reminiscent of some of the, the heart of the central themes in, in the WMD free zone. So there's another reason to think about why it's so important to think about the zone, not just in, in terms of addressing the zone in and of itself, but also even in terms of addressing some of the other contemporary arms control and security debates in the region today. I was wondering whether we could possibly turn the conversation towards some of your work at UNIDID that centered on gender and disarmament, because I was I have to admit, I'm personally a bit of a fan of yours, and you are one of the women that has recently been at the forefront of the work that's going towards disarmament overall. And we've seen a massive shift, I think, in terms of the inclusivity of a lot of notable organisations, also like within and outside the UN. And I just was wondering what implications you think this increase in women's visibility and also race, gender, intersectionality has for the field overall in terms of the kind of work and research that it gets done when it comes to disarmament. Yeah, uh, Anahita, and uh, I think I'm only one of a whole slew of women, uh, initially women, that were uh, very much keen to start to introduce gender into uh, the arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament space. And, and indeed, what really struck me was how the disarmament space was in a way a bit of a holdout on some of the debates around gender, um, not just limited to women, as you said, but a much more inclusive discussion about what is security, how it's experienced by different uh, humans and, and, and societies, and how we can rethink security when we bring in a more gender and inclusive perspective into, into our work. Um, I have a, a good talk forever about why I think some of the reasons for it to have uh, the disarmament space to have been particularly resistant to that. Uh, and of course, I, I should also say it's not, it's important to remember that some of the earliest disarmament champions were women. And we think of, of course, of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. But in terms of what has been the implications, what are the implications of, of increasing this space? I'll, I'll give you a few examples that have really come from some of our work on, on gender uh, in, in UNIDIR. Um, thinking about the first discussion of gender in the context of the Chemical Weapons Convention, yeah. that first discussion only happened in 2018. 2018 or 2019. It's astonishing for me that the first side event on, on gender was happening as late as that in the, in the Chemicals Weapons Convention. But in so doing, it allows us to bring a different set of questions to issues around considering what the uh, convention does and its implementation. It allows us to think about the different ways in which chemical weapons and the use of chemical weapons affect men and women, girls and boys. It allows us to begin a discussion on what would you need when you're investigating alleged use of chemical weapons. You'd need midwives. You'd need gynecologists uh, on your on your analysis team. That's a new lesson that we wouldn't necessarily be aware of. In questions then of the impact in terms of communities of let's say as we see from the pandemic, and that has relevance for discussions around the BWC uh, convention. And of course, we have that review conference in, in December this year. We've seen with the pandemic the differentiated impact on carers 
and how the bulk of women are carers in, in, in either in residential care homes or in home families. So we begin to get another way of thinking about threats, about attacking threats, about preventing them, about mitigating, but also about how there are different ways of thinking about achieving security that we can reach a broader set of actors in our society and in our community and actually come to better solutions. You see that a lot now around the uh, issues of conventional weapons, in particular small arms weapons, small arms light weapons, and, and the role of women in society in different communities, both in preventing uh, weapons uh, and especially illicit trafficking, but also in, not just because I get upset sometimes when we think about gender and women as victims in, in context of yeah. that. Uh, and I think it's really important that what the debate around gender and disarmament has done, including through frameworks, international uh, gender networks, has been and gender champions networks, has been to say what is the positive that women bring to the room, uh, that bringing young people in the room, that bringing different perspectives, LGBT uh, and perspectives to the room, has, I think had a huge impact on changing in a way, mixing up the room. And I don't think that work is done. It's only really starting. If you look at some of the debates now in emerging technologies, in the uh, debates around artificial intelligence and lethal autonomous weapon systems, in the debates around digital regulation, mm -hmm. use of cyber weapons, um, I'm struck by the fact that although these are relatively newer areas for multilateral and national debate, they're even more male than some yeah. of the uh, WMD and conventional weapon spaces, precisely because of where where women are in STEM, uh, and that is science, technology, engineering, math kind of fields, but also because somehow they're perceived to be areas that are cachet and emerging and it's very interesting who who moves to those spaces yeah. where is there in space for inclusivity or in topics that are considered hot so i think it's there's a real opportunity as well as a challenge to say we have an opportunity to open up these discussions earlier than we've learned in debates around weapons of mass destruction and conventional weapons so how are we going to do that and then also we have a greater requirement arguably to do this because of the um, very specific ways in which we need to think about bias in artificial intelligence and in the very non-destructive but more disruptive ways that those weapons are used and can affect the fabric of our lives and very much all the women, men, children and groups in society. Thank you so much. I was wondering in terms of those opportunities and challenges that you just mentioned, how would you necessarily kind of apply them to the MENA region specifically? What would the approach be different? Do you think there's a different kind of plethora of challenges in terms of how we talk about gender, race, intersectionality when we talk about a WMD free zone there? Or Yeah, the Middle East is is diverse anyway, and we have to be careful about the Middle East, and the zone incorporates North Africa, porn, and the Middle East. But it's, it's, I think it's fair to say that progress on gender equality in particular, um, much less progress on more wider inclusion uh, and intersectionality is, is, is slower than in, in areas that we might look at in Latin America for example, in the role of women in arms control in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, or in the context, say, for example, of, of Europe. Um, and I think it's important to find a balance between offering external perspectives of what is an inclusive conversation and encouraging that those debates internally. Yeah. But what I would say the WMD free zone can do, precisely because of its breadth, precisely because it addresses biological, chemical, um, nuclear, it can be a space in which you can bring in a much wider range of academic fields and perspectives. You need historians, you need psychologists, you need uh, conflict resolution experts, you need experts on conventional weapons, nuclear uh, chem bio and is that a space therefore that you can bring in uh, a wider uh, 
opportunity for engagement. That gets at something that has always been struck by in the zone discussions. It's very much linked to um, foreign, foreign affairs officials and to a particular segment of civil society or of uh, civil service. And I think it's important for us to think about opportunities to expand that conversation out of the diplomatic chambers, but perhaps to the universities, perhaps to the um, nuclear energy, to chemical processing, to a whole set of other uh, uh, forms and industries to engage. And then finally, a big part of us in our discussion um, on looking at country by country workshops and, mm -hmm. and national debates is to allow perhaps for more openness and more space for inclusion precisely because it's not two people representing country X, you know, let's say Lebanon, mm. but a more inclusive space. Because what we're finding from gender and arms control experience, women are managing and doing better at getting into the room. What they're not getting is leadership positions or heads of delegations or senior spokespersons. And therefore, finding opportunities to work on and in the region it's not a, doesn't help it, doesn't solve the problem overnight, but it certainly just opens up that a little bit more space and opportunities for engagement. Thank you, Renata. We, sh we should finish there because we've run out of time, but uh, this is too interesting a topic to leave at that point. I wanted to ask um, beyond what you've been talking about around getting more women and more diverse people into the room, explore a little bit just for a couple of minutes on, on what impact that could have on the quality and the nature of the conversation, because uh, we live in a society where certain attributes are attributed to people who uh, present as more masculine and other attributes as more feminine. And and this goes beyond whether somebody is male or female, but uh, but but the attributes within the security realm tend mm. to be ones that have been in the past associated more with masculine characteristics. And and personally, I think that's where the problem, where a lot of the problem lies, because uh, there's there's qualities around clarity, around direction around specificity and around strength and um, resourcefulness and and uh, independence and individuality and um, essentially uh, uh, survival which all of all of which in our cultures have been associated with masculine rather than caring reaching out dialogue conversation would, would you have any comments on that uh, on not just the justice of having greater representation but also the impact on the quality of the conversation uh, which could in the end in the long term be quite revolutionary on our understanding of security oh that's a sensitive point and i'll i'll, I'll say why i think it is sensitive but let me just say that <clears throat> I agree with you very much that certain qualities in arms control discussions are prioritized. Um, technical knowledge, deep historical reference, um, often military experience or background is, is registered as, as a benefit. And all of those features, many of those features are gleaned through um, military experience, through mentorship, through mirroring, you talked earlier, um, Paul, about mirroring, but an older generation of diplomats selecting, nurturing, growing, another generation of diplomats, oh, who look just like them, who stand mm -hmm. just like them, who speak just <laughs> like them, and who maintain the, um, the language, the terminology, and never query or challenge some of the assumptions that guide those debates. And one, I have an argue, a belief that one of the reasons why arms control has, has suffered in some of that paralysis has been precisely that lack of new thinking and that resistance to new thinking. So the impact of diversity is absolutely critical in so much as it offers us a way of breaking open 
the types of topics we talk about and the ways we talk, talk about topics and frames the opportunity for, for example, someone to say, why not gender? Why not victims uh, assistance issues? Why do we talk only in terms of strategic stability perspectives? What are these other perspectives? Brings in uh, visions of perhaps a more, a more wondering sort of discussion, a debate that recognizes that there are unintended consequences, that there are ways of thinking about, or when we test our assumptions that we need to, to be prepared for uh, working out a range of assumptions. So more scope, more, more, more less rigidities and less zero sum. But I'm always a little bit cautious at somehow the debate that somehow when women in the room is going to lead to more gentler outcomes. Because of course, that risks suggesting there's a set of innate female quality that can be as limiting for women as, as straight jacket, the consensual straight jacket that, that, that we talk about is in the arms control space. So I'm always a little bit cautious on when we say prescribe female qualities. I think for me, the quality is diversity, freshness, challenging assumptions um, that we bring to a space, offering different perspectives and expertise. What I do think potentially, and it has been demonstrated in some at least business case studies of women in, in, in private sector, some more willingness to find win-win solutions. Potentially, are there some tendencies, are there some instincts towards more um, inclusive approaches that are less based on notions of total dominance? And perhaps that's the biggest thing, dominance, um, that I don't think uh, has been sufficiently recognized the value uh, or the or the trap that focuses and perspectives around dominance uh, can bring us so i think yes i'm i'm very comfortable about um, illustrating the value of diversity at the table and what it gets us in terms of better ideas and better solutions and more thinking through unintended consequences and more thinking about plans a b and c and more flexibility and potentially more scope for win-win uh, mm -hmm. outcomes. What I think we just need to be careful of is repeating the sins of our literally fathers uh, by mm -hmm. ascribing a certain set of uh, personality traits or skills or trends to different groups by virtue of their gender. Thank you so much, Renata, for joining um us for a really really insightful discussion i really enjoyed that thank you paul um thank you to everyone who's tuned in for another episode of in the zone our podcast uh you can find us online at www.wmd-free.me where you can subscribe to our newsletter donate money or even volunteer to work with us just a reminder that we're also on social media our twitter is under the same handle at wmd free me similarly on facebook and instagram and our podcast at uploaded bi-weekly on SoundCloud, Spotify and YouTube.